budgets and what we have planned for the next few years. So I'm going to turn it. Do you guys want to call your boards into order? Um, Maury, Eli, Lisa. Lisa, are you up here alone? Yes, you're Manchester Board of Selection is in order. Manchester Finance Committee is in session. Michelle, where's Michelle? Go sit on the Michelle is calling the Essex Bank Council. Okay. Great. So, Michelle, um, Michelle, Brandon, are you starting? Yeah, I'm just adjusting the. Uh, and um, Avi, do you want to just kind of frame this conversation, what we're, what we're talking about this session, and kind of what we hope to talk about in the spring? Sure. Uh, well, um, in our last conversation, we talked about uh, trying to understand how multi-year planning for each of the three entities that are here, which is the uh, town of Essex, town of Manchester by the Sea, and the Manchester Essex Regional School District, come together and how they interrelate with one another. And we've been working in uh, great collaboration partnership for many years. Um, but as each of the entities have started to become more and more um, proactive in their multi-year budgeting process, we wanted to make sure that we are uh, continuing to do that uh, with good communication between the three entities and interplay, because in the end, we're all very much uh, interrelated. And the um, budgets uh, of any one of us really do relate to the budgets of others. So we, the last meeting, briefly we talked about the operating budgets, how those interrelate. We talked about the uh, uh, tools that we're using uh, to begin uh, working together and sharing information using a common format where possible and having common information and where possible. And is being done on the operating budget side. Uh, we've also talked in these meetings about how that could happen from a capital budgeting standpoint. And so tonight's meeting is to uh, take a look uh, at the capital budgeting side of the equation. And just like we began the operating side first with a preliminary conversation of what what is operating budget all about for each of the three entities, before we got into a subsequent meeting where we start diving into models and numbers and assumptions. I think tonight, again, being the first time we're talking about capital budgeting, uh, we're gonna each have some time to present briefly about what capital budgeting even means for our entity, what capital spending even means for uh, each of our entities. Uh, and so I think each uh, of the three groups, uh, between Brendan, Greg, and uh, me, um, we'll all have a chance to talk a little bit about what capital budgeting is like and what it means for our entity. So if you'd like, I'd be happy to start briefly with the school system. Uh, we approve two budgets every year. One is the operating budget. Uh, the second is a capital budget. And by that, it really breaks down to one simple thing, which is debt service. We have debt service for one reason only, and that is uh, bonds that were issued for construction of this building. Uh, the middle school, high school project, and that's the only debt we have. And we, uh, by statute, uh, Mass General Law, uh, are required to have a separate capital budget each year, um, which we do. That budget is sent to annual town meetings every year, just like the operating budget. Uh, the costs are apportioned between the two towns, uh, uh, much like the operating budget. Uh, unlike uh, the operating budget where we receive some state aid, uh, we do not receive uh, state aid directly to pay for our bonds, um, but I will explain a little bit about how um, the state did play a part. So we apportioned the entire cost between the two um, towns in accordance with our regional agreement. The apportionment formula is similar uh, to the operating, but slightly different, um, and it is based really on um, populations and property values, not based on um, student enrollment. Uh, and it roughly breaks out um, currently to about two-thirds uh, for the town of Manchester and one-third for the town of Essex based on those formula inputs that were agreed upon at the time of regionalization. Uh, when we built this building, the total uh, project budget was $49 million. Um, at the time uh, that that was brought to the two towns for a vote, uh, it was uh, 
agreed that the towns would be willing to take uh, on debt up to the full amount of the project. Uh, and the estimates that were given, from what I understand, because this preceded my being here, uh, ended up coming in about half of what we expected for a couple of reasons. First, the state did get involved through the Massachusetts School Building Authority, which is the state granting authority that oversees uh, school construction, uh, to provide matching funds for this project uh, to the tune of, uh, I believe, 40% of, of eligible costs. And so that was a big um, amount that was taken off of the taxpayers. Two, uh, the interest uh, costs that we ended up paying when we did go out to bond were much lower than the initial assumptions that were projected, uh, partly because they were conservative and partly because um, the school system at the time and still does maintain a very good credit rating, uh, which is important to minimizing uh, taxpayer uh, costs. And uh, so those are really the two, the two biggest items uh, that helped us to yield the savings there. Uh, so the way that uh, debt was structured was to, uh, unlike a mortgage payment where you pay the same amount every period, uh, which is called level payment uh, structure, we did what we uh, through really the advice of the two town finance committees. Uh, it was their vision to uh, have a different structure, the other option which is called uh, level principal, which means you pay the same amount of principal more or less each period, and as a result, what happens is because uh, you're continuing to pay down that principal, the interest cost over time goes down. And so the good news is that each year we have a slight reduction in the uh, cost to the towns of that debt, which is uh, allows the towns to have some money freed up for other things. Um, but would, I would, I should clarify that comment. So uh, first, uh, as part of the vote by the two towns, it was agreed uh, and required that each town not only approve the budget and the debt, but that they then go to a separate vote, which happened back in around 2009, uh, to allow that those debt payments to be excluded uh, on a temporary basis from the Proposition 2 and a half limitations. So, uh, Overrides you may have heard about, those are permanent exclusions. Uh, you can have a separate type of exclusion, which was done for this debt payment, which is called a debt exclusion, which is temporary once the debt is paid off uh, completely. Uh, and it's generally between 20, 10 to 30 year debt. Once it's paid off completely, that allowance to exceed Prop 2 and a half goes away, and it is uh, not something that can be taxed in the future. So it's a temporary exclusion to Proposition 2 and a half called the debt exclusion. So uh, that was done at the time, uh, and so as I mentioned, the amounts are going down each year. Uh, and then the only other piece of addition is that we did recently refinance the debt, uh, and because, again, we have uh, a good credit rating, we're able to take advantage of favorable market uh, conditions. And with restructuring the, of the debt, which is totaled at the time of issuance, was, um, I'm just, I believe it was, the 32, about $32 million out of the $49 million project cost. $32 million was bonded through debt. The other $17 million was paid by the state granting authority. Uh, we refinanced that debt and saved about $1.7 million for taxpayers, which translates roughly to about $90,000 to $100,000 per year. So um, we, uh, all the debt payments that we are uh, due uh, in the future to finish paying out these items, they're known in advance, uh, and um, I, at some point, I, when we get the PowerPoints going, maybe after the two towns present, I'll be able to show some of those schedules just so that you can see what they look like. Uh, we're not gonna get too far into quantifying things tonight because it's probably a little bit of a deeper dive than we need. But uh, basically, the good news about the debt service we have is that it's all structured, known, the payments are known in advance. So it does allow for a great amount of predictability as it relates to any obligations for this building. Of course, at some point, if we, um, the only other types of items that we would typically issue debt for are other construction projects. And as everybody knows, um, we have uh, conversations about what will happen with the two elementary school buildings, which are both you know, you know, in the 50 to 60 year um, lifespan. And obviously, we're going through a project now examining what uh, the state of affairs is with the Memorial School in Manchester. Um, so clearly, that will come up at some point. Um, but we're really not there yet because we're still in the feasibility process. And at this point, we're really just trying to understand what do we have, what are some options, etc. And uh, so that's kind of an overview of um, capital budgeting.
for town, I'm sorry, for the uh, regional school district. Uh, again, I don't, I haven't pulled it up yet, I apologize, but um, I'm happy to kind of show a little bit about how that predictability flows and some of the numbers that we have. Um, and I can take questions now or you can take them after the two towns um, get a chance to talk a little bit about their items. Quick question, what, what is the interest rate on the debt now? Uh, it ranges uh, between uh, high twos to low three percents um, based on the structure. And uh, we have three different issues that make up that 32 million. Uh, we did a 25 million at the front, then we did a 5 million after that, and then we did a, a final 1.97 million, which is the $2 million issue. So, uh, so they're all at different rates, but the, that, those are the range of numbers. And they actually are made up of little sub bond caplets, as they're called, I believe, or something like that. So they, they each have slightly different coupon rates, but those are the numbers in the high twos to the low we've, we've consistently done really well um, with those issues. Any other questions before we move along? In terms of that's a, yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. So, yes, uh, because typical operating expenditure, sorry, capital expenditures for a school system, the biggest things we face typically are buildings. Uh, that's where debt issuance, issuance is needed. It, you know, towns obviously are doing a lot more larger capital projects around roads and sewer and those types of things. So we haven't issued any other debt and in order we currently have plans to for uh, other operating items um, and uh, you know I, will that always be the case I don't know but at this point we certainly have no plans to you know, issue debt at all for anything other than the building projects um, so, so the boiler will move that you're taking out of well I, I would say that that's contingent on the next year's yeah. If the Memorial School project goes through, then it would proceed as simple having to come yeah. um, for something along those lines. If it doesn't go through, we would most likely like come yes. in front of the town yeah. for the exclusion to be yeah. yeah. So one reason that we're in feasibility now for the Memorial School and backing up from that, looking at both of the elementary schools, is we did uh, do an analysis uh, sort of a inventory analysis of what we have in each of those two buildings and the individual component trees like roof, envelope, mechanical systems, et cetera. And what we determined is that, um, you know, those items are so significant that they really far outstrip any ability to handle within uh, the operating budget and they uh, are one time in, in nature. So yes, for that reason, um, we have done all the maintenance that we need to do to keep them in good condition but for a major replacement uh, at this point, that would, the philosophy is that that would be tied to a building project, which is I think how most school systems do things. There are some projects that happen where um, a newer building can need something like that uh, for schools that have maybe fallen behind in their uh, service, and, and if it's just limited to mechanicals, the MSBA has a process you can go through that is just for you know limited um, uh, investment in, Roof or mechanical systems, but when we submitted um, the Memorial School and Essex statements of interest, MSBA was quite clear that uh, in their assessment, this, uh, that what was needed over there far exceeded the ability to do targeted investments and the like. So yes, uh, yes. What's the usual time horizon for the debt for a building project, like 30, 40 years? Uh, yeah, the statute, I believe, was recently extended to allow 30 year. I think our first issue was 25 a year. Uh, our second issue of 5 million, I believe, was 30 year. Uh, the 25 year, $25 million project was the one that we refinanced, but it didn't change the time frame. And then the 2 million, because it was such a small amount, and the reason it was small is because we were waiting to see what the final exact number was from MSBA before we bonded, according to statute. That one was so small that we, uh, the town finance committees who really advised on all the structure um, decided we would go with a 10-year payoff for that. Um, so. Great. So maybe I'll hand it off to Greg or Brendan. 
Okay, um, good evening. Um, in the small group where we started to talk about what we were going to do tonight, we talked about showing the existing debt, which I'm going to show, um, and then what our expected capital needs are, are coming forward, and then perhaps some solutions, creative solutions for dealing with debt that are not just an override on the taxes. Um, then later in, in March, actually, we're going to start to put some numbers to this stuff, and we'll have the real numbers with respect to the school project. At that time, we'll bring some of the, uh, the information in on the town's expected uh, figures for some of its future projects. So I'm going to start, hopefully you can see it, it's bright enough. Um, I'm going to start with the town's uh, existing debt. FY18 is all the way over um, on the left. And it goes through FY34. You can see that our sewer debt drops off after FY24. And after FY29, it's only school debt. That's a line that shows the school debt. You can see where they merge. That's just school debt after 29. That orange line represents the sewer debt. Um, you can see that's a high amount of our debt. It was a $28.5 million sewer project. Then I'm breaking it down for you because that top uh, olive line versus the, the navy blue line, uh, that's how we, we break down how we're paying for the sewer. That top line represents 72% of the project that's being paid for by betterment, whereas that lowest line represents 28% of the project that's being paid for with exempt debt by override. It's all override, but the source of funding is different. And then all other debt is uh, the red line at the bottom. I do have figures for all of this, but I don't think at this point in time, unless people have questions, it's really necessary. I can go back to any slide uh, that we need to, to see. Yeah, actually, just before you move on, I the big message there for the town of Essex is that the period of time between now and 2024 is particularly fraught, and then sort of 2024 to 2029, you start to um, create space in the current um, cost load per household. But that our, you know, as we go into our needs, I mean, we haven't exactly projected them because there's not enough hard data yet, but they do start to pick up sooner than 2029. So then we have a, a problem to solve basically between 2024 and 2029, which I expect is probably very similar in Manchester. Any other questions at this point? So the total debt payments on the town side, what's, what's your question? Just over two million right now. Just over two million right now. Whereas total debt remaining is about 19.3 million. 11.1 um, .1 of that by mostly uh, exempt taxation, and 8.2 million by betterment repayment in a rate, like if you had a, a betterment of one department. So now I'm going to move into. Sorry, well, and one more thing, sorry, Brendan, just, I want, and this will be an issue for all of us, maybe even more so for Manchester, is given the tax plan. That's going to also, just from a straight impact to households, be another impact we need to manage, of course, because the state and local taxes will be capped in terms of what people can write off. So that'll be sort of a direct hit to their bottom line. So these are just all things we'll need to manage all at the same time. So I'm going to move into now what the, what the major capital needs of the town are expected to be um, in the future. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, it looks like it's bright enough, so I won't look at the screen, I'll look at my screen. Um, the fire and police headquarters, uh, we have been working since fiscal year 2005 to find a solution for uh, an antiquated building. And many others have been working a lot earlier than that on this problem. We expect that in, uh, uh, in the uh, spring, we'll be looking at a vote to do something to fix that problem. Uh, one could be to build a larger public safety facility on the present site. Uh, another could be 
to renovate the existing public safety building to make it police only. And in between the fire police station that you know now in town hall, put a new firehouse. Um, and then another option would be to acquire new property and build a new combined facility or even a single discipline facility on that site. Again, it's going to happen quick. We're looking at an annual town meeting question being proposed <coughs> to the voters. Uh, in this case, the funding source could be up to 40 year bonds because through USRDA at the last, uh, USDA, I'm sorry, uh, meeting, I mentioned that through the rural community program, you can get up to 40 year financing. The last time I checked with them, it was two and three quarters percent. So that's, that's an attractive option because it could cut your yearly expenses in half. Then I show the Memorial School project. Again, this is a fall a timeline for both towns and the district. We're all participating in this. The options analysis is wrapping up. Uh, in this case, I put 20-year bonds, but you just heard Avi say that there's an option for 30-year bonds. A portion of that would be offset by SBA, 30 to 31 percent. Is that correct? Uh, eligible costs. Oh. Yeah, of eligible costs. Then in Essex, we're putting in the fiber optic municipal area network to interconnect our various uh, buildings. Um, we did an appropriation in November. We are hoping to begin construction March or April. And in this case, it's not a tax source, it's the Town Technology Fund with money that we negotiated for capital when we did the last Comcast Our water system, like many communities, the plant, the wells, the distribution system, are all in need of, of review. We're looking to do a facilities plan funding uh, at the annual town meeting using water uh, enterprise free cash. We do a facilities plan. We will look at um, prioritizing things that we need to do with that system, and then incrementally, over a long period of time, <coughs> tapping that. At the same time we do water, we would also address drainage and paving. Um, the, the time horizon is going to be priority items quick, and then a very sustained, long-term rejuvenation of the entire system. The uh, state drinking water SRF will give you 2% money for 20 years, or 2.4% money for 30 years, but that same USRDA, I said RDA, USDA Rural Community Program will also do water for 40 years. That may trump all of that other stuff. We'll have to study that. Our Centennial Grove, which is a recreational area uh, at Tobacco Lake, we're hoping to, to do a master plan with a planning firm. We already went out to bid once. We're changing the scope because we didn't like the result. Uh, we hope we already have the funding for that. We're hoping that the master plan can identify program-driven revenues to self-support that facility in the future. We might even sell a portion of the property to help develop the rest of the property. Also, grants are possible, but since that is presently a <coughs> residence-only facility, your ability to get state grants or federal grants is limited. Then, looking way out, the Essex Elementary School project, maybe around 2023, we'll be looking at feasibility Around 2024, 2025, we'll be looking at funding like we are now for the Manchester Memorial School. And funding source could be 20 or 30 year bonds. Fire police vehicles, DPW and trucks and equipment, that's ongoing. There's always something on the schedule and we kind of march that forward. Um, we also have uh, some mini stabilization funds for major vehicles, town buildings, recreational areas, maintenance and repair of the town hall library. That's our newest one. Uh, we fund that to the tune of about $20,000 added per fiscal year. And then under discretionary, public access improvements at Kenoma Point. The selectmen are looking at the improvements we've done to date, and then they're going to determine whether the town has an appetite for additional improvements. And then I put dredging and coastal resiliency. Now, coastal resiliency isn't really discretionary, but in Essex, we're looking at creative ways of potentially getting federal fund funding for that. And so it's not being looked at as a major town funded effort at this point in time. Now I'm going to move into some creative ways of looking at funding <coughs> projects. 
I mentioned the 40-year uh, financing. This may be important to our public safety building project. This may be important to our water system project. Use of cash reserves. Believe it or not, we did what you're looking at right there uh, in cash. We fortunately had a fund where we sold property on Canoma Point. We had $12.5 million in the fund. We have seven and a half remaining. Some of that money could end up in the public safety building project. Um, some of that money, as I'll talk about in a minute, could be used to bridge a period of time where we don't want to do debt payments. Um, community preservation fund. Here's a shot of during the town hall phase one part of our town hall renovation, we had the east wall of the town hall start to collapse on us. It wasn't even part of that phase one. We used CPA money for this historic building to the tune of 100,000. We do not have a very large CPA fund, but it's another source of funding that you can help to defray costs of some of these things. Regional grants. We're a member of the regional dispatch center. The state funded that center at $12 million. So far, since someone else built the infrastructure and the things that run inside that infrastructure, we've saved, after this fiscal year that we're in, one and a quarter million dollars over our own uh, way of doing things with our old uh, center that we ran ourselves in town. Regional operations. This is another, like the regional dispatch center, our computer infrastructure replication is in Melrose. So we have disaster recovery by buying a little piece of someone else's infrastructure. That avoids typical life cycle costs of replacing all of your own things uh, on, on a certain cycle. Uh, public works grants. Uh, right now, I believe it's now called Mass Works, but the municipal parking lot that you see there, the pump station toward the bottom of the screen, uh, which also has public restrooms in it, and the playground behind the pump station were all funded with um, public works grants. And in fact, there was a time, the loophole is now closed, where you could fund one state public works grant with another and make it the match, and we actually did that, and we achieved the perfect storm with, with uh, public, uh, public facility grants. Can't do that anymore. Special purpose grants, uh, every community is eligible for community development block grant competitive funding. The larger cities are entitled to community, so they have some money that's given to them every year. But we, com we competed for this money and built the new senior center with that. It's kind of a special purpose grant. Uh, state transportation money, if you've ever been through downtown Essex recently versus what it used to look like, we got a lot of improvements on vehicular, bicycle, and pedestrian throughput. That was all done with, a, uh, with state funding. We didn't put any of that money in. And by the way, they're coming back and they're redoing the bridge now, all, all at no cost to us. As I mentioned earlier, um, for coastal resiliency, we want to look toward a time when perhaps we can be first in line for resiliency mitigation funding. We need to dredge our river but that's, that's hopefully going to just be a side effect of using the, the creatively reusing the sediment that's in the river in the name of coastal resiliency planning. And there are many ways we plan, re, plan to reuse that sediment. Uh, I'll also mention that if we move our fire police headquarters to one of the particular options, we might get more benefit for the future of protecting against sea level rise and climate change. Because right now it's at a pretty low uh, elevation. Um, state revolving loan fund, I mentioned that before, so if you're doing sewer or water, there's 2.4% uh, two and two, two and, uh, money. If you noticed in the graph I showed relative to the sewer debt, it was a straight line. That's because we were, one, we were on the last round of funding when we did our sewer that was still offering 0% grant equivalency, which was quite a benefit to us. Um, green community grant, we had $130,000 for becoming a green community. We put that all into the town hall project to defray eligible costs there. This year, we're actually uh, using the money in the Essex Elementary School for lighting, the steam trap replacement, and building automation uh, management system. Uh, sharing uh, equipment, there's a picture of a, uh, a vac vacuum trailer that we share with the town of Rockport. 
uh, intentional savings, so special stabilization funds that I talked about, um, putting money aside for particular purposes, and as I also mentioned, can you take cash reserves if you have them, and at a point in time where, the, where all the, all the uh, debt lines that we're going to see from school and from town are just too crazy to, to swallow, can you bridge some of that with cash and start your debt repayment at another time so that the taxpayer sees it even? It kind of just flushes that out. So that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah? Can you tell me um, what percentage of your budget uh, constitutes uh, debt service? Um, it's currently around two million. Only about a million of that is taxed because a lot of it is that sewer paid for by the sewer betterment on a sixteen million dollar budget. So whatever, whatever that is, down twelve and a half percent. Yeah. Any other questions? Good question, Brendan, on the CPA. Do you pull funds from year to year, or what, what's the sort of duration that you stockpile? Well, in Essex, but, in Essex, first of all, when it first passed, it passed at only one half of 1%. Okay. And so, as you know, you have to put 10% away for three of the purposes, and then 70% can be used for any of the purposes. And so, initially, we really didn't use a lot of that money because there wasn't a lot to use. And in fact, when we had that East Wall failure, yep. That hundred grand sucked up a lot of the money that we had. I'm happy to say that we're now at one and a half percent. The town made a change in that. And we've really done uh, several small projects as opposed to anything major, the biggest thing being that wall project. Um, right down to something as small as restoring um, some decorative safe doors that were hung on the walls of the renovated town hall from an old safe that was in the town hall. Uh, for like 3,500 bucks. So we've really used it. We've, we've, re we've recreated historic cemetery wrought iron fence mm -hmm. in phases, little things like that. So I really don't have anything major to point to. Um, but it's been a good source uh, of funds. And as the 1.5% grows, and maybe if the law changes again for better matches at the state level, that will accrue faster and we can use it for other things and bigger things. So Any at other? our last town meeting, um, Brendan was recognized with a, an award of recognition from our town for his contribution to our town. And I think this is a perfect example of the, one of the most amazing ways that Brendan contributes because finding these sources of funds, it, it's 99% Brendan, you know? So we owe you a big debt of gratitude for the amount of capacity that we freed up in our town by finding these other sources of funds and we really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. A debt exclusion. A debt exclusion of gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? What do you agree? Okay. So it's always interesting. The more we dig, the more similarities there are between the two towns. Um, our annual debt is, is very similar. We're at 1.9 million a year. Um, we have similar graphs. I don't have it up on the screen. I don't think it will project very well. So let me um, just pass out some, some paper copies. <laughs> so our approach of late after deferring and deferring for years, as most communities have. Uh, we have been much more aggressive in our efforts to try to make up for the backlog of, of capital improvements. And so what we have been doing is, fortunately, we are in a period where we have been retiring a fair amount of past debt borrowings, uh, retiring those, those bonds, and issuing new bonds for various projects, primarily focused on water and sewer. So again, what this graph shows, similar to what, what Brendan showed, uh, obviously a little different dynamic. Um, if you look at the bottom line, the bottom line numbers, the annual debt service. So this is just for um, these elements. We also started last year 
doing what's called a capital expenditure exclusion. So you can, not only can you exclude from the, the limits of two and a half what you, uh, your debt payments might be, but you can also identify cash projects that you can exclude. And so when, as we retired debt, we weren't ready to issue new debt. So we wanted to give some stability to the amount of money that was being uh, dedicated to capital. And so we retired some debt and we also then put in its place capital exclusion. So you see that 1.5, we issued 300,000 in capital exclusion, so we're at 1.8 in the current year, and we project it to be right around that 1.9 every year, depending on how much debt. Um, so this shows, again, um, some drop-offs between now and 24. We reduce our annual debt service by another um, 500,000 or so. And again, if we were to not issue new debt and go on a more of a cash basis, we would then do those capital exclusions every year. So that in 2024, we'd have 500,000 more that could go towards paying our capital needs on a cash basis. Um, we're intrigued by trying to go to a cash basis. Obviously, you save um, the interest payments, and you can redirect those interest payments into actual projects on the ground. Um, so our goal is we're currently, um, as I said, around that, that 1.9 million total to keep it at that. And we're also slowly growing the amount of um, the general fund going to, um, going to capital projects. So again, the most, the most important takeaway, those, that bottom line, if we don't issue any, new, any more new debt, we see that going down to about a million dollars, and then really much slower drops because the newer debt has been uh, on a level basis, annual payments and interest the same every year. So we don't drop down then until in the early 30s. Uh, Another interesting point about the early 30s is that is when both our pension and our OPEB liabilities will be fully funded, um, which will significantly help um, help the finances, albeit some 17 years ahead from now. <laughs> if only we could fast forward. Um, so similar to Brendan, uh, Manchester has been pretty aggressive over the last few years in, in obtaining grant funds. We've received a little over $4 million in the last four years for various projects, um, from um, dredging to, to seawall improvements, um, green communities, funds, et cetera. The Safe routes to school, the, uh, the sidewalk projects, and the reconfiguration out in front of the, of the Memorial School was, was a transportation grant. Um, so we continue to uh, have our eyes and ears open for those opportunities. They are very important um, to all of us. When we look ahead, again, we are trying to live within our current um, amounts for townside projects. So keeping within that 1.9, if you don't issue new debt, again, this will be that uh, capital exclusion money. So what do we need looking down the road? So roads, we need to invest about $400,000 a year to um, maintain the roads, the road structure that we have, about uh, a little under 40 miles of, of roads that need to be maintained. On the water and sewer side, again, lots of pipes that need replacing, valves, et cetera, to the tune of, on the water side, needing to invest about a million dollars a year. 500 to a million a year for water structure. Um, our analysis shows we, we've got about a $40 million fix, uh, but that's over a 30 year period. Um, so a million, and, you know, a million and a half a year, we're at this point targeting about a million on the water side. Uh, on the sewer side, not quite as uh, dramatic, with the one caveat. Um, so we're spending two fifty to five hundred thousand dollars a year uh, again fixing pipes, getting rid of a lot of infiltration and inflow, unwanted water in the system. Um, on a bad day and a, a heavy rainstorm, our plant normally handles about uh, four hundred thousand gallons a day. On a, on a two-day rainstorm, we'll take in three million gallons of water. Um, so we've got a lot of leaky pipes, and we need to get rid of those uh, those leaks. 
And the, the caveat with the sewer plan is if we have to relocate. So it is located at the lowest point of town. Yes, water drains downhill, everything else. So that's typically where you put it to collect everything. Um, so the plant itself is actually a couple of feet below sea level. The, the, the guts of the plant are actually a couple of feet below sea level. It's protected by the railroad uh, embankment, basically. Um, so sea level rise could pose a major threat to that plant. Um, if we're able to fortify it in place, a much lesser number to deal with. If we have to relocate that plant, um, that's that's a huge number. That, that would be a 30 to $40 million project for us. Um, and I bring it up not because of sea level rise is with us today, <coughs> though we're seeing some effects of that, but we need to make decisions about whether or not we start reinvesting in the same location in about four to five years. Um, so the question and the decision point for that plan is, is coming upon us soon. Uh, and that'll be a tough decision to make. Rely on some engineering to see if we can fortify it in place because that's a less, much less expensive um, way to go. Um, other needs. Um, so other needs, not as, as high, certainly um, we have an old town hall, probably we'll live with it. We could use some upgrading, um, probably not do uh, much of the upgrade that, that, that Essex does, but we're jealous of that job. Well, we, we, we did live with it. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, yeah. It. <laughs> uh, So there's some needs there. You know, maybe is that another million or so? Again, seeing that being absorbed within our 1.9 level that we target. Um, there's talk of a desire for a senior center in town. And again, perhaps pursuing some grant opportunities and, and, and fundraising opportunities. Um, Seniors are our biggest, uh, fastest growing population in the cohort. We're about 33% uh, over 60, and that'll grow to 40% um, to plus in the next uh, 10, 15 years. And so pretty dramatic growth in, um, in that population group. Uh, so there'll be demands on us for, for servicing that, that cohort. Um, resiliency and seawalls, uh, big question mark. We have not put money into our capital plan for that at this point. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a major question mark in terms of what is really needed. Um, with the king tide and the full moon the other day, we had probably about three inches of freeboard around the entire harbor. Um, so it's, it's coming. What we do is a, is a question mark on that. Um, the other handout I have for you is, is our capital plan for the next five years. This is not good, you know, this is the, we, we update it every year. So you can take, uh, take one, pass it on. So what you'll see in this five-year plan over the next five years, it anticipates spending uh, just under $19 million on various capital needs from DPW trucks to uh, new HVA system, HVAC system in the town hall to um, some small library improvements to fire trucks to police cruisers and then to the larger project water and sewer and, and another round of dredging. Fortunate to um, to receive half a million dollars for the, for the dredging project that we're just finishing up. Um, we will need to do dredging basically every 10 years. Um, with the grant money, we are able to speed up uh, the next phase sooner than that. Um, but basically, a dredging project every 10 years and dividing up the harbor into four sections. Um, it, it leads sediments about every 40 years. Exception. Um, so each section is, you know, right now it's about a million and a half all in. Um, we do pay for that through ongoing fees. We collect um, you know, about 800 mornings out on the harbor. So that pays for the mooring operations. Um, again, I'm not going to go over this in detail, but it gives you a summary of those expenses, uh, what, we are, what we anticipate needing to spend over the next five years on the various categories of, of the in the town. 
So this is, as you can see, the funding on the back end. You can turn it over. Again, the general fund taxes of that 18 million plus, um, close to 6 million. Um, significantly lowering the amount of fund balance because we're trying to go on a more cash basis so we want to start using um, those revenues on an annual basis when we receive them. So when I see bonds or cash in that second to the last line, so the last two years, 17 and 18, those were bonds going forward, um, except for the 21 where we have a million, um, a million and a half for dredging, which would be paid, which would be a bond paid for by more fees, all those other dollars we're hoping to do on a cash basis instead. So that's a quick overview of where we are with our um, capital planning and, and funding strategies. Obviously, this is all focused on, on the town side. Um, I would say there's been a significant uptick in what we're trying to do, trying to, trying to play catch up on a, a lot of deferred capital needs. Again, it's very typical. Communities all across the country are in a similar situation. Um, this, this spend, is proposed um, doesn't do everything, but it certainly gets us uh, further down the road than we are now in terms of maintaining some critical pieces of infrastructure. Um, Brendan mentioned the um, various options for, for funding, and I'll just, I'll just add a couple more to those. As part of our new master planning effort, um, a lot of attention has been focused on what we call our limited commercial district, which is the area north of 128 um, as, the, as an opportunity, perhaps, for some carefully planned uh, new commercial growth. We have a very small commercial base, as the as, as, as um, We're 90%, 95% uh, residential. Uh, but there's the possibility of expanding our commercial base in that area of town. There seems to be uh, more support for it this time around than there has been in years past. And as part of the master planning effort, um, there's been some discussions about how to look at that zoning to allow for uh, additional mixed uses that are targeted towards um, identifying needs. And one of the areas that have come to the fore is the desire for um, a community, a life care community. And um, they have a developer who owns land up there now who's very interested in that, and that may be a possibility. So my point is, we can try to grow our commercial base in order to help bring in more, um, more tax dollars with, to help pay for our capital needs. Uh, so that's certainly one area. Um, another area we are currently subsidizing, basically, are water operations. Um, smaller extent to the sewer, but 100% of water capital is being funded through the general fund. So it's it's. You know, taking out of one pocket versus another, in the sense that it's still the same citizens paying the money, but we could shift some of our capital debt service away from the general fund to the ratepayers on water and sewer. Uh, that could free up some capacity in the general fund. Again, you're, you know, you're taking out of a different pocket, but um, there's a different payment structure and people may feel better about that approach. So that would be another alternative to help us uh, with our um, softening the blow, if you will, with any new debt payments that we might have to absorb. Um, I should have prefaced it by saying that obviously you can do 100% as new excluded debt, but that's just tag tagging on all of that on top of what people are currently paying. So that's a hard nut to swap. So if we can soften um, or reduce the size of that nut, I guess to continue my analogy of swallowing something, uh, it, it might help. Um, so these are ways that we might be able to soften the blow or lower the size of this, lower the size of the new debt exclusion to pay for for school um, for, for the school projects. So those are ways or options that we should be talking about. I mean, in addition to the to the many um, that Brendan had, I won't repeat them. He did a good job of outlining those various options. So let me stop there and answer any questions you might have about uh, some of the interesters. Let's go to suggest this. Do you have different commercial and uh, residential taxes? No, we don't. We have a single. 
Because it's I, such I, a small commercial. It's so small that uh, to have any meaningful impact, it's hard to, to get there. The community I came from, we had that pretty well. Different dynamic. Greg, do you know if Gloucester, we talked a lot about, they had a vote the other night. Did they eliminate the, the difference between commercial and residential? No, they have a very small difference. But it's very small, right? Yes. They, they don't want to alienate it. their one point zero store owners. owners. One point zero three. Three, I think, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a three percent shift. Very small. Bit. Yeah. I should mention, and in, 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 uh, Brendan talked to, spoke to this as well, um, I think there's a, there's a growing interest, which I'm pleased to see, about um, efforts to lower our costs by looking at regional services of, of sorts. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that long term, that's where we have to go. There's obviously a long, strong tradition in New England in particular of going it on your own. Um, and I think the, the economics will, will drive it, um, and hopefully we can be slightly ahead of that curve. We're, we're anticipating those, those real crunch points and start talking about um, shared services. Hamilton Wenham, does it share police and fire? No. no. no so not. is it only schools, or what is what is regionalized there, and what, what if anyone has any visibility into like, what works and what's not really working? There was a dispatch. Right. They but did share dispatch, but then uh, went well, to, the regional. to the regional, to the rec. Oh, okay. Um, we currently, with one of in Hamilton, we share a, a dog officer. We're small potatoes. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and I think, I mean, you're, you're a veteran agent as part of the region. The Eastern Essex Veterans District, we were part of that. Right. We, we teamed up with Gloucester and Rockford for our veteran agent. But so again, these are very small. Right, but they dip, dip your toe in the water. <laughs> they're only regionalizing their schools. I'm sorry. Hamilton Lennon only regionalizes their schools. I, for some reason, Correct. thought there was more. They they did a um, a full study to do much more. Yeah. Uh, maybe half a dozen years ago or so. Um, it it did not did not materialize. Um, now my old community um, out in the western part of the state, Lee and Lennox. I was in Lennox, um, and my counterpart in Lee, we had talked about sharing our jobs once he retired. Yeah. Um, and they've gone ahead with that. Uh, they, they moved ahead and they, uh, so they're sharing the, the town manager, and they've hired a, a human resource person to be between the two towns. Um, not huge savings, but I think it sets the stage down the road for more collaboration and, and larger savings. I wanted to comment on, on the fact that um, particularly for Essex, we're the same population as Nahant, roughly. <clears throat> there aren't too many others that are, there are some that are similar, but not the same population. So in a town with a population that small, as soon as you have to do whatever thing it is, like have a police force, or run a dispatch center, or do whatever you're, it is you're talking about, on a per capita basis, you lose. And in fact, you might remember a few years ago, the Boston Globe did a big story on it, how Essex police costs per capita was so high. Well, of course they were, because you need two police officers on to handle domestics. But in a, in a town that is almost double the size, you could probably still get away with that. And what does that do? It cuts the cost in half when you look at the numbers. So we're always looking at stuff like that, and we're, we, we look toward regionalization, because it doesn't make sense for us to have the whole thing. It makes sense to be able to leverage a piece of someone else's. And that's where we, I agree with Craig, we have to keep looking in that direction. It's interesting to bring that up as well in light of the future major capital investments we'll be making for police and fire. Yeah, I mean, the timing of those two conversations, I'm unfortunately, not exactly aligned, but I mean, after the school, it's our largest line item, so it's an obvious place to start looking. I mean, for the fire department, we need a new facility whether we had a regional fire district or not, because you need a place to respond from. Yeah. So that's capital no matter what. For the police department, it's a little bit different story, and that's one of the reasons we're looking at potential to build just a new firehouse and just rehab the old building for police only, so that if in the future something shifts, we didn't spend all the money on it. 
So we're looking at that, and that's going to play into the calculus as the town and the finance committee and the selectmen and the town building committee continue to look at what the best option is. For police and fire, is it the, is it the age of the building, the facilities, or is it yes. Kirk doesn't mean Kirk protocols? It's, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's both, both, but the age is driving that. This and is the then cost to maintain. We're maintaining asbestos in place, um, things that it wouldn't, it wouldn't be worth removing it because the thing isn't going to be around in its current form long enough to do that. The size um, of the trucks are outstripping the size of the doors. On yeah, the, the, it was built when fire trucks were it's smaller. <laughs> it, it's all kinds of stuff. We had a we had the main engine floor with a, a cavity underneath, and we had to replace the entire slab. It's these creep creep up things that are killing us. And really, with the all call fire department, we, they really deserve better than, than what we've got right now. And they're the best uh, they're the best the best uh, plan in town for us right now is our fire department. So um, I think there'll be tremendous support, at least for the fire side of things. Uh, is Manchester a call file with the fire department, or? Less and less. less and less, yeah. Virtually non-existent, though. Mm -hmm. Not true. Uh, are there other good examples, maybe on Western Mass, where there already are some towns that put in place, you know, regional fire police, other than just kind of a dispatch center? Across the country, there are. Uh, some very interesting examples. Pennsylvania and Michigan, in particular, have been sort of leading up uh, merging fire and police operations. Uh, they've got, got some successful models. There are communities that tried it and they reverted back to the in individual departments. Uh, but, uh, but, but also, outside of New England, you see, obviously, county governments much more active in providing services. Uh, and you don't see that. Here. There are, there are Massachusetts statutes that do allow for regional fire and police district commissions. Uh, that's a completely different form. It would almost be like another regional school district where there are people that run it and the communities that are involved in it uh, fund it. I, I don't know of any examples, if there are any in the state, but it was put into, uh, into law yeah. in, in in somebody thought about it at some time. Yeah, I just thought maybe on Western Mass, where obviously my small town, that's why I thought it might have happened somewhere out there. Yeah, all those small towns rely on, on uh, state police. Okay. They don't have their own. They just don't have police. They don't have police. No. There's, there's probably a lot more regional dispatch um, centers than there are yeah. any regional fire or police. Yeah, uh, they're mostly probably all volunteer fire out there. <coughs> yeah, well, varies, but yes. yes. What is what does that look like when you to rely on state police? Is there a cost that is the cost share, or how does that work? Uh, it depends on the town and how much uh, how much service they're asking mm -hmm. from the state police. Uh, it varies from town to town. Michelle, I don't think you could. I'm going to follow up on that. I mean, is it like a charge per? You know, they they tally the number of. Okay. Visits the state police make and they charge it that way, or is it kind of like a. I'm annual? sorry, I didn't hear that. I'm just following up on that question about state police. Like, is it, uh, you know, they, they just charge an annual amount regardless of how many calls they take, you know, or is it, you know, kind of on a per call they charge X amount? Or? No, it's usually, it's usually a lump sum. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. But as population grows, then the number of, statistically, the number of things that are going to happen increases. And at a certain point, it outstrips the ability to use the state police to respond in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I don't think you've got an adequate answer to the question. Um, Manchester used to have eight full-time firefighters and a call force. When I went on the call force in 1973 of 30, mm -hmm. um, wow. now we have 13 a chief and 12 full-time firefighters and a call force of a handful. We have three in the Call Vol Academy right now, hoping to get them graduated and joining the call department. So I want to kind of ask you a question about that, because there's a lot of mutual aid between the two towns. So what does it really, how much does it matter? Because, you know, Essex is usually over here if you guys need us, and we're, and we're you know, the same is true either way. So does it, how much does it matter that you have your dedicated crew here? What's the rule? Response time. Oh, okay. So we're running ALS ambulance in-house. 
So that's, that's the real driver of having a minimum of two and you really need three with the option of getting that fourth. So if you, if you have back-to-back -back ambulance calls, it takes four people. What's, what's Essex Ambulance Service? We only run a basic life support ambulance and that we utilize. We were getting some assistance from Manchester, but the call volume is such that we've moved back to a private provider for uh, advanced life support because it was actually too much of a strain, at least lately, on what Manchester could provide while providing for their own. Yeah. We should look at what we can do to promote the volunteer firefighter force. Like marketing, incentivization, and such. I mean, it's such a huge benefit to the town. But, but they, they have that young explorer group in Essex, mm -hmm. which is kind of high school students that are mm -hmm. um, kind of being yeah. I thought you guys were part of that. Yeah, they are. Yeah, uh, yeah we've put together like with the Manchester and Essex yeah. fire departments. So. We're also looking at people who work for the town, like at, in, dur during the day for the DPW, we have someone who's interested in being able to respond if, if we need that capability. And um, there are some, there's an administrative burden to that because how you pay the person, it involves a blended overtime rate, a custom calculation, things that you don't deal with every day. But we're supporting it because at the end of the day, it will keep the call fire force uh, in place longer and it's saving us a bunch of money. Essex has a very proud heritage uh, of that service. They, are, they have done their best to keep it going. There aren't too many um, all call fire departments in Metro Boston anymore. We're one of the few. And well, we're Rockport, very happy. Rockport is all call. Yeah. So yeah, there's, only, there's not that many. No, but of the three contiguous towns, we're yeah. the anomaly. If you can do it, it's good, but not everyone can. Well, being you a have call to have fire today is very different than when Tom yeah. started in 1973. Yeah, we learned to hitch the, the horses up. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. Mark, I didn't know the horse's name. You didn't know the horse's name. <laughs> And now from the proper side. <laughs> but the, the training and the responsibility are very, very different things now. And they, yeah. they really require a, um, you know, a, a skill set that most people can't do on a part-time basis. They almost seem exclusionary. It's a huge time commitment. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, the Call Ball Academy um, is, I don't know where it's meeting now. It usually meets in like Groland or... Georgetown, someplace in the middle of the yeah. uh, Byfield, someplace in the middle of where everybody comes from. They have to be there by six o'clock on Tuesday and Thursday nights. They get out about 9.30, so they get home at 10, 10, 15. And then about every third or fourth Saturday or Sunday, they have a whole day at the academy in Stowe. Like all the time? Yeah, yeah. that's for about uh, four months. So it's a pretty, pretty rigorous training um, regimen to get through. We're looking at some things like, like a seniors tax work off kind of situation. Just look at things like that for volunteer fire force, firefighters too. I mean, that's a big commitment. And yeah, I don't think there's anything that exists. Yeah, statute for that right now, but it's a creative idea. Some, some communities have tried to incentivize them by paying for, you know, a, a good percentage of the town, town's insurance, so they can go on the town's insurance if they'd like to. Because hmm. that could very quickly become our third largest line item. Could <laughs> so if you read, if you... First of all, are you, would the boards of selectmen be the two parties that would start discussing regional efforts if they wanted to pursue them? And have you guys talked about that at all? We have talked about it um, some. And uh, I think some of the initial discussions uh, happen between the town administrators because uh, they deal with the, the nitty gritty, the operational aspects on the But it's worth having, uh, I think, more discussions uh, between the boards and um, having more ideas offered up by uh, the communities. One thing that's a little bit 
tricky for us is um, reading the communities and determining what they would what they would accept. So there's a certain amount of effort to go out and try and um, inquire um, what people would uh, be willing to put up with in terms of shared fire services. Or I know that ambulance is a uh, hot topic in Manchester. They, they Yeah, whenever we start to talk about ALS service, there's always a couple people in the audience who owe their lives to the ALS service because they, you know, started them on the drugs in the back of the ambulance. They went right to the Salem Hospital, and an hour and a half later, they were on the table getting a stent put in their aorta or something like that. You know, the doc basically says to them, "If you didn't have that service to start with, you wouldn't be here." Right. So it's, I mean, I think we, uh, public safety, we're going to have to assume we're going to right. figure out a way to deliver at least the same level of service, if not better, but it's just a matter of if, if, if there is optionality. So we talked about fire, and maybe fire is more limited than ambulance because of location, but potentially police, is, they, they're out in the field all the time anyway, so it's a little bit more flexible. Some other areas involved, it's funny, you should mention it, because just last night we were having this conversation. We said, who's going to start, who starts this conversation? We pointed to Brendan. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to actually have the next, the selectmen quarterly have all the department heads and board committee chairs in. That's going to happen on January 22nd, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Try to get ideas from everybody on the team. What could be done better regionally? We're also going to talk about whether there's a capital investment that could be made in any particular area that will actually pay for itself in efficiency uh, or in just, you know, an improved uh, operation and maintenance scheme or whatever have you. So we're going to tap our people and then if any good ideas bubble up, um, maybe we will come see you, the select will come see you, you know. I, I have floated, uh, we hear a lot about our police, as Brenda mentioned, the cost per capita of police for us is, is a high, high number, uh, disproportionate with other towns. So, I have sort of thought of, well, what if we were to regionalize the police force? And, and after hearing a lot of um, feedback from people about, you know, about, oh, we pay too much for the police, what do they do, blah, 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 and we say regionalize them. Well, no, we don't want that. So, <laughs> okay, you don't want to pay for them, you don't want to regionalize them, well, what do you want? So it, it's a conversation that needs to be had, and it's something we do need to get input from how many of you like to put it out. We have to understand the appetite um, of, of residents for, uh, it would be some significant changes in how services are delivered or perceived or you know, the feel of your community, whatever it is, but it, when you're faced with uh, or offer some substantial savings, it may be more palatable, but it's, um, we need to talk about it at, at the level of boards and committees and then also do some outreach with the public to understand what, what might work. You know, a few years ago, Ray Randall was doing some conversations. And Tom, you might have actually participated in some of those, Ray, about regionalizing some of the stuff. And he was he was sharing articles. These two guys were talking about New England and kind of like ways that different towns in New England, everybody wanted to have their own big fire truck. And the cost of that to these towns, which they really just couldn't afford. And you know, I'm wondering about these big pieces of equipment. I mean, Brendan already talked a little bit about sharing of those big pieces of equipment, but, you know. You know you I can also buy used as well, which we've done. Yeah. And like a ladder truck. It's, it's okay. infrequently used, and you can get one that still has some service life in it uh, and save money that way. Manchester actually just, just very recently actually started um, buying some smaller we actually had some um, places where we could not get to with our existing equipment. And um, uh, I don't remember the SUDEX on the current truck. It's based on like an F600 platform. And uh, it's a much smaller, much cheaper vehicle. Uh, it's kind of like the squad that you just bought, Brenda. That kind of, that size. Exactly. That size, yeah. So going the direct, other direction can be uh, cost effective as well. We, we also, um, it's about eight years ago now, got a grant for 
I knew Engine One. Um, it wasn't through the Safer program, it was through some program through the fire service. And I think the new Engine One, which was about a $450,000 piece of equipment, cost us about $45,000. We had to pay 10%. You know, the, the cost of those pieces of equipment, uh, Salem is the most recent place around here that bought a, a big tower ladder about two years ago and it was uh, one and a quarter million dollars. Yeah. I mean, it's just like little towns can't afford that. Right. <laughs> it's just, it is part of the master. Goodness. Yeah. It is part of the master planning discussion in Manchester, right there. I feel like at one of the meetings I went to, we talked about the development we were talking about behind the map, that that could be a central location for shared services between Manchester and Essex, but there would be satellite um, people or equipment in the current spot. We're just about to build a beautiful public safety building. So. <laughs> Can I have two other items for consideration on the list, which would be um, less implication on life and death, uh, some type of uh, re all region technology infrastructure to uh, management sharing concept, and DPW maintenance, custodial, and general grounds. Maybe a way to cut our teeth on something that doesn't have such Strong I mean, motion like, like double location. If we can build a strong foundation for one or two things, lower impact on people, but good financial impact, we might be able to set the stage for larger conversations. Yeah, I think the tech infra is like a no brainer because it's just, it's just bits and bites. I mean, why wouldn't we look at that? DPW, the Paul's like our yeah. best budgeter. I don't want to lose the one that less squeezes the blood from the stone. So I don't know how much. Extra room we have in there, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's just a. It's definitely everything. It's just getting the idea, and maybe it's going to cost more to do it as a team effort. Well, the, uh, to do it the, way we're doing it the town of Danvers right now um, has been the lead on a grant application to start running fiber to interconnect each town's own fiber roads, and they are looking at that. We participated in that. We understand that if it's funded, it's it's only going to be funded at two hundred thousand of the three hundred thousand dollar cost. And how we bridge that gap, we don't know yet. Maybe with enough tenants in their center. If you can get back there for free, now you're really just paying for hosting. Right now to get to Melrose, we're paying, we're using a, a MPLS link, which is very expensive. But at least in this version of the contract, Melrose agreed to foot the bill for that. That's coming to an end, and we may be looking toward Danvers in the new fiscal year, because they may be able to deliver that same efficiency for less money. I think um, 2020 town meeting, annual town meetings would be very telling about our future because that'll be the first year people are feeling the new tax plan plus the new school probably, right, in that realm. And so I think we'll be able to really look at brass tax that year. Like what do we really, I, mean, I suspect given our cultures of our town, the answer will be, okay, fine, we don't want to change anything about our culture, we just will pay more, <laughs> given past historical evidence, but, but uh, 2020 will be coming. Um, just one thing, I think before we go to the regional issues, I just want to make sure before we depart, did you promise to throw up some of our schedule numbers so people can Oh, please, Avi. Uh, yeah, I, <coughs> yeah, I also am happy to kind of put that off and fill out that more all the information is sufficient. So, if anyone wants to make sure they see that, we have that available. Kicking off the meeting. So, just throw it out there if people want to have to get your feet on the regionalization. Why don't you phone it in? Phone it in? Okay, anything else on capital budgeting? We're going to probably meet again um, in March to talk about the real numbers that we have from the building project. Um, so, this is the test group project. Really, the numbers really aren't, isn't going to be solidified until the end of August.
Because the, the number that comes out of this current phase is just trillion. Yeah, but I think we're going to have a fall, you know, a pretty fall yeah. That'll be a safe number, though. James, who is um, recording us, wanted everyone to turn to the camera and wish people happy holidays. So would everyone like to wish people happy holidays? Happy, happy holidays! holidays. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Anything else? You just want to sit around for another 45 minutes? Yeah, should be in the back. Dr. Lyra? Are you ready to go? Anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? All in favor? All in favor? All in favor?